Marco Polo traveled from Italy to China to meet the great Kublai Khan and came back with inventions, food, and tales of a magnificent empire that stretched over half the world. And 200 years later, a certain Christopher Columbus set off from Spain to find a new route to the Mongol Empire to make his masters rich. But famously, he didn't have a clue what he was doing and ended up in the Americas, which he thought were India. But even if he had made it to China, his real goal, he would have found that the empire was gone, vanished into thin air. The Mongols were nowhere to be seen after controlling half the known world. What happened to them? This video will answer how the empire went from being its peak to being over in a relatively short time frame. But first, the drama of succession again. As we saw in the previous video, Monk Khan had sent his brothers Kublai and Hulagu to conquer the rest of China and Persia respectively. Persia was in the bag, but Monk died while trying to finish the job in China. He died from a mystery illness. After the death of the Mongol Khan since Genghis, the family had rushed back to Mongolia to try to have themselves declared Khan. But this time it was a little bit different. Kublai raced back from China and fought with his youngest brother, Eric Bok, over becoming Khan. Kublai was very bougie by Mongol standards and loved cities and buildings and so wasn't popular with his people. Arik was more a man of the people, so he was declared Khan by the Mongols. But Kublai undermined him by calling a smaller Hurultai and having himself declared Khan amongst his mostly Chinese supporters. He also declared himself Chinese emperor to inspire loyalty amongst them. There was a standoff, two Khans. Kublai had an ace up his sleeve though. Arik Bok and Karakar needed food from China to keep going. Kublai starved them out and then attacked his homeland. Kublai publicly embarrassed his brother, Arik Bok, as revenge and probably poisoned him years later. In all of this, the Mongol capital Karakoram was looted and largely destroyed by Kublai. With the Chinese and Mongol combined army, Kublai now controlled the world's largest army, but he was never legitimate to his own family, who begrudgingly accepted him. Hulagu, the third brother, knew his brothers would fight bitterly over the emperorship. Instead of fighting, he decided not to look a gift horse in the mouth and realized it was better to remain in Central Asia and the Middle East and claim it as his own. Conveniently, it was the richest part of the empire with more wealth than the rest of the empire combined. This part of the empire became known as the Ilkhanate and it created a separation between Persia and Arabia that slowly but surely led to what is modern Iran. His cousins around Russia and Ukraine refused to join him and they became the Golden Horde. They're not super important to our story though. The fourth part of the empire was the Chagatai Khanate, which surprise surprise came from those who descended from Chagatai, one of Genghis's elder sons. For context, Kublai, Hulagu, Haribok, and Monk were each other's brother. They had all become Khan, just not of the same large empire. Having gained control of northern China and some of Mongolia, Kublai realized he didn't have to forcefully conquer the rest of China. It was better to persuade the people that he was the best choice than their current Song Emperor. He took a Chinese name, created a Chinese dynasty, the Yuan, and a new capital, what is now Beijing, but was called Kanbali or Dadu. Kublai effectively created an early version of the Forbidden City to keep his unusual habits away from the public and allow them to be themselves. But in public, he tried to make himself seem very Chinese and the aristocracy supported him as he offered the possibility of creating a unified China. Kublai really wasn't anti Genghis Khan though. Not only did he not look to forcefully conquer China, he looked to expand via the sea, something Genghis would never have even dreamed of. He had heard of the Spice Islands and wanted in on some of that. First stop was Japan. He built a new navy in Korea. It was probably the largest armada in history. They set sail for Japan, and when they landed, they were confronted by a group of samurai. Who would win? Kublai's hybrid Mongol-Chinese army or the expert samurai? It was a no contest. The Mongols won. The samurai retreated inland and then, for unknown reasons, the Mongols got back on their boats. Weird. Then a storm hit the poorly constructed ships and a large portion of the army died. That was that. Except it wasn't. Kublai then sent ambassadors to negotiate a Japanese surrender, but they committed the cardinal sin and murdered them. As much as he wasn't like his granddad Genghis, he was still a Mongol and the murder of an ambassador was unforgivable. Back Kublai went but the Mongol army weren't used to coordinating tactics at sea. They failed to reinforce each other and picked up diseases, but they regrouped and prepared to attack again. As they prepared to land, another huge storm turned up and killed up to 100,000 men on the ships. They had the worst luck. That was the end of Kublai's dream in Japan, and he made sure everyone forgot it ever happened. 
nothing to see here. Here began the Pax Mongolica. As things settled down in China and Persia and amongst the Kievan Rus and the parts of the empire controlling them got over their hatred of each other, then the people within the borders had a relatively unprecedented century of peace under Mongol rule. The commitment to trade for Mongols continued even as the empire split into four because each ruler had financial interests in the other areas. As big as each area was, they couldn't produce everything there or get all their best people and ideas. If they each agreed to enable the movement of their own property and goods between territories, then it made it possible for others to do the same. Kublai sent ambassadors throughout the known world, with one going from China to Jerusalem, and then to Constantinople, then to Rome, then to Paris, and finally to see Edward I in England, before heading back to China. It was one of the longest journeys in human history, until the last few hundred years anyway. He discussed Europeans and the Mongols helping each other against the Mamluks, so they could retake the Middle East in yet another crusade. This conversation was on and off for years, but ultimately went nowhere, despite good relations. Speaking of long trips, Marco Polo was only able to make it from Italy to China and back because of the trade routes the Mongols protected between the two places. By the time Marco Polo arrived, the Chinese were using paper money and they had universal education in the colloquial language, centuries before Europe did the same things. And as they built up more trade, and after the Japanese campaigns, they realised that goods could be moved much quicker via water, so sea and river trade became essential. It's hard to believe it now, but in Europe, this idea of trade was considered immoral or wasteful. You made and consumed what you required. Why make too much and have to give it to a neighbour? They eventually changed their tune on that though. China was the main production factory of the world. It's funny how the more things change, the more they stay the same, eh? It didn't just produce Chinese goods to be sent to other places, but also things that, say, only Europeans wanted. Even the English names for goods the Mongol trade network introduced to Europe gave away their origin. Satin, muslin, Damascus are all named after the places that they were shipped from in the East. The use of cards to play games exploded with the need for traders to cover large distances. There are a lot of things the Mongols spread all throughout the world, but how come we don't know about it at all? complicated. It's true that they did spread materials, skills, technology and people everywhere, but they were not the originators of most of the techniques and ideas, they just appreciated them and saw how they could be used to make their empire more efficient. That's one reason we don't give them too much credit. Also, as they like to copy and integrate so much from other cultures, there's very little obvious evidence their empire existed. Nearly every other empire in history has clear architecture that means that if you visit places they controlled, you can see signs they were there, even if long gone. Except for Karakoram, Xanadu and early Beijing, the Mongols didn't build much. The style of the former was unique to them, but as Kublai had it destroyed, Xanadu didn't outlast the empire and Beijing has changed a lot since, then they're almost erased from existence. Even though Europe didn't suffer much due to the Mongols in the end, it probably gained the most with the least pain to get it. The trade network brought so many things to Europe that just wouldn't have got there so easily if that network didn't exist. Francis Bacon in the 1600s talks of three things that modern culture was built on top of. Printing, gunpowder and the compass. Guess which empire meant that these things spread around the world at a way faster pace than they would have at any other time. Kublai died. But no matter how good he was at ruling compared to those that followed, that wasn't the end of the Yuan dynasty in China. Hulagu died, but the Ilkhanate didn't vanish immediately. The Golden Horde and the Chagatai Khanate kept chugging along. It also wasn't a long, slow, inevitable decline. It was pretty sudden, mostly gone in a decade or two. One side of it was that each part of the empire became culturally unique to each other and adopted the ways of the area they ruled. This meant the sense of loyalty to each other fell if this was the reason it vanished, then it would have been a long, slow and drawn out process. But we know it wasn't. So what really happened? In China, the Yuan Dynasty had a series of natural disasters including floods and famine. They also had poor rulers, and even the good ones were divisive by favouring Chinese culture over the Mongol. This meant that most emperors could only keep the army or the people happy. Never both. All this strife and borderline civil war allowed a remnant of the Song Dynasty to re-emerge. The Mongols retreated further and further north until the Ming rose up and conquered everything they had taken. The rest of the empire was a bit different. 
the Mongol trade network was a marvellous way to move goods around. It also happened to help spread diseases. One particular disease swept through Persia, Arabia, the Golden Horde, where it reached Crimea, where the Genoans traded. They took it back to Italy with them. It then spread all through Europe and wiped out up to 50% of the population. It devastated the population in Europe and Asia. It was the Black Death. In all this instability, the Ilkhanate was overthrown. The two biggest parts of the empire are gone. The Golden Horde actually finished off the Ilkhanate by invading, but it limped on itself for a while longer, and the Chagatai Khanate for even longer, with a relative of Genghis in power in the region in some form until the 20th century. But the Mongols were mainly pushed back into Mongolia, and were never a major force again. It must have been fun while it lasted.